your membership card? Uh, 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 listen, excuse me. Do you know anybody who can fly a helicopter? Any helicopter pilots? Hey, hey, do you know anybody who can fly a helicopter? Alright, welcome to Devlin's Domain. Today I got a release from Arrow Video UK. This is Region B. Uh, Kino Lorber released this in the US, so if you just don't have a Region B or Region Free player and would like to watch the film, uh, maybe check out Kino Lorber's uh, release. It's probably a little, might be a little cheaper too, but I picked up the Arrow UK version mainly because I prefer Arrow releases. They just look nicer. Uh, they have more extras on them usually and uh, I just think overall they just do a better job. They look better all around. Uh, but this is Miracle Mile. A film I haven't heard of before this was uh, released by coincidentally by both at the same time. Uh, both studios put these out. Uh, made in 1989 uh, and it was apparently a unproduced screenplay that had been sitting on the shelf for a while and uh, they kind of just didn't think it was going to be a, a film that would be worthwhile. Director Steve Desjardins, I'm not sure how to say that, but uh, he directed Cherry 2000, which is a, a key, another Kino Lorber release that I actually have on hand that I'll review eventually. Uh, but he directed that, and he ended up bringing buying the rights back to his, his script, a script he wrote, and uh, he bought the rights back and made the film himself. Uh, it's, it's about a guy named Harry, played by Anthony Edwards here. Uh, he falls in love immediately with Mary Winningham. Uh, her name is Julie in the film, and they meet at the La Brea Tar Pits. Uh, it's kind of odd. And uh, they have a date set up, and he oversleeps. His alarm clock doesn't go off. He oversleeps, misses the date uh, by a few hours, and... When he goes outside, the world is ending. There's a nuclear holocaust going on, and he's trying to locate the love of his life that he just met uh, in the midst of all this chaos. So, sounds like a pretty cool idea. Uh, a lot of black comedy in it, some romance, of course, the nuclear explosion chaos going on. Uh, but this is an HD transfer. Uh, it's got two audio commentary tracks, one with just the director and one with the director with the uh, cinematographer and production designer. Uh, there's also an interview with the director. Uh, there's an interview with both uh, the stars of the film and a uh, supporting cast and crew reunion featurette and the music of Tangerine Dream. They do the soundtrack on this. Uh, and it's got an interview with the co-composer Paul Haslinger. Uh, also deleted scenes and outtakes. And a short story read by Steve Desjardins called Ribu Rising. Maybe I said that right. Either way, let's open it up check out that reversible cover. Alright, there's the front cover. It looks a lot, uh, very similar to uh, the cover for Stormy Monday. Uh, it's just like similar type of art. Uh, the poses are different and all that. Just color and everything reminds me of the Stormy Monday cover, which I did review on here as well. Hopefully this is better than that one, though. Stormy Monday wasn't awful, it was just... I wasn't all that into it. But this is a, a blind buy, so you kind of hit or miss. Usually Arrow puts out some stuff that I really like. So, even though I had a couple disappointments lately, uh, my hopes are still high for this one. So there's your Park Circus. There's your Blu-ray and DVD. That's the artwork that's on the Kino release. And it is also the reversible art for this. So yeah, if, if you're looking for the Kino release, and just keep a lookout for that artwork when you go to a website or Amazon or wherever. Definitely like this artwork better though. Let's take a look at the booklet. There's a police car and a department store. Kind of 
kind of looks like the guy from the room. <laughs> yeah, I think he was a doctor or something. Definitely not him, but just kind of looks like him. Anyway, there you go. Oh, look at that. That's a great picture. That would have been a good cover, too. I love that. Pretty excited for this one, actually. After seeing all that, I'm going to pop it in and let you guys know how it is. Wow, so Miracle Mile ended up being a lot different and a lot better than I expected it to be. Uh, I'm not sure what I really thought this was going to be like, but they took it to a place that I didn't see coming at all. Uh, you have the main character played by Anthony Edwards named Harry. Uh, he meets Julie, played by Mayor Winningham. Uh, they're at the... La Brea Tar Pits is it's really quick, uh, maybe 15 minutes establishing uh, this romance that they have. They meet at the Tar Pits, uh, they st they set up a date and all that. They have like a little little bit of fun together. Uh, she brings her dad along for one thing, and you know they, you see him playing in the band and or uh, Anthony Edwards' character, uh, and they set up another date for I guess like later sometime and uh she, she, you know they, they have a kiss and she, she tells him that she, she's gonna fuck his eyes blue or some, some shit like that uh anyways he's excited for this date because he's gonna get laid and uh like he ends up oversleeping some for some reason and uh you know she's all prissed up and ready to go out waiting for him and uh he doesn't show he's like three hours late once he wakes up he freaks out takes off uh, and he ends up at a diner, uh, she's not there, and there's a payphone, he, he's like trying to get through to somebody, and then there's a phone call that comes through, and he answers the phone, and there's a panicked person on the other line, uh, who thinks he's talking to his dad, he's got the wrong number, so, he, but he lets out all his information about, uh, bombs being shot off, all this kind of stuff. And then he gets shot while on the phone, and a person comes on the phone and tells uh, Harry here to just disregard everything he, he's heard and forget about it and just go to bed. And so he's like, okay, whatever. And then he goes into the diner and he's sitting there with it, and he's like freaking out because he doesn't know whether to just disregard what he just heard or if it's actually like something seriously crazy is about to go down. Because it sounded like nuclear bombs are being shot towards uh, their general direction. Uh, of course, he, he eventually ends up freaking out in the diner, warning everybody what, what just happened. Most of them don't believe him. Then they, you know, the more he talks, and uh, Denise Crosby from, uh, you might have seen her from Star Trek The Next Generation, short blonde hair. Uh, sh she's in this film. Uh, I think this was around the same time she got cast in Star Trek as well. Uh, 1989, and uh, she even mentions that in one of the uh, extras. Uh, but uh, she she has some working relation with something that has to do with this, and she's like taking him serious. He has some information that he shouldn't know, like a civilian shouldn't know, and uh, just repeating what he heard on the phone. And once she hears that, she's like, "Oh yeah, this is some serious shit. We need to." do something and then the uh the the guy running the diner he's like freaking out he's got a shopping cart full of uh you know canned goods and stuff like that he's getting his van ready to go he's gonna try to avoid this nuclear holocaust that's impending um everybody in the diner is pretty much upset and freaking out and uh they they all pile into this big you know big truck and, and like a ups type of truck transport truck and uh they got the food they got you know civilians i get they're going somewhere i think they're going to the airport or something but uh he he's gonna go look for his girl but if somebody stole his car so he's gonna you know ride along with these people and uh they won't stop for him to you know they take him they they get so far and he's like okay we need to go this way because i gotta pick up my girl and they're like no fuck you we're we can't stop the world's about to end uh, we're going, and so he kind of just jumps out of the moving vehicle and bails, ends up hijacking a car, uh, 
to, to get to where he's going. <laughs> it ends up finding her. I think she was like asleep or something and he like, kidnaps her. <laughs> and uh, he's pretty much, we gotta get out of here. Like shit's, shit's going down. He doesn't really want to tell her the truth about what's going on because, uh, you know, he doesn't want to make her freak out like everybody else is freaking out. And, but as the movie goes along, more, you know, the word is spreading. He, he got that one phone call and told, you know, a, some people in a diner and and since then word has gotten out to like everybody so everybody's freaking out uh you know it take it takes a little bit to gradually you know get to that level but uh i think i think the story is told in like close to, you know as far as like as soon as he wakes up and realizes he's overslept i think from that moment on it's it's pretty much told in real time as far as like, oh, this is, you know, they're not doing big time jumps or anything like time lapse type of stuff. It's all pretty much you seeing this shit go down as it's happening. Because I think in the diner he says you got like an hour and ten minutes left before the bombs go off. And then it goes a little bit over. Because, uh, you know, this entire time you don't know if this phone call was legitimate or not. You know, it sounds legit, you know, while he's on the phone. But who are these people? <laughs> You know, and, and is it just a prank call? Like, all this chaos could have been just caused from some pr prank call, some asshole. Uh, you just don't know. And, and you're just watching this whole city just turn into chaos. Uh, it looks a lot like, you know, the way we've seen things uh, somewhat recently, the past couple of years, when people just freak out over dumb shit. Uh, and sometimes not dumb shit, but still, you shouldn't freak out to that level where you're burning your own city down <laughs> but uh that's pretty much what's going on here everybody's just you know you got people who are just like hey fuck it we're all gonna die let's just do what we want and this, and this like go crazy start shooting people uh breaking into shit looting uh there's wrecks all over the all over the road because everybody's trying to get out at the same time they're all getting pissed at each other it's just it's just chaos it's, it's human beings being stupid like they always are and uh you know, the, these, this couple here is stuck in this mess. They're trying to get a helicopter to somehow get out of there, uh, get out of that town, get out of that city. Uh, so, it's, yeah, it's just the whole movie is just a mad rush to, to find safety amidst this, uh, you know, likely apocalypse that's about to, they're about to face. Uh, but it's, there's some darkly comical things in here. I don't think this was intentionally... Uh, meant to be a comical film uh but there are uh a few things that are sort of humorous you know scattered around here if you have that dark sense of humor uh you know the acting's pretty good uh it's it it, it is it, due to the subject matter and what's happening it is actually like a pretty light tone to it considering it's a very dark thing <laughs> Which I guess is where where the dark humor comes from. It's you know it's not really like funny. It's just light. It's a light take on a dark subject. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's it's pretty damn good. I I think I really like the ending to this. Uh, I won't get into that, but because <laughs> you should watch this to get the ending. But uh, this this isn't the ordinary cookie cutter type of type of film type of romance film there's shit this happens in this it's just crazy uh definitely recommend this one uh if there's a uh interview with the director where he kind of talks about the ending and that that amongst other things is, is reasons this film was never made uh before he had to buy the rights back to it because he wrote the scripts all to his studio and they wanted to change shit and he was like no that's the way it is, that's the way I want it. So he ended up buying it back. I think he had offers to rebuy it from him because a lot of you know a lot of studios wanted this movie. They just didn't want it the way he had it. They liked the you know initial premise of it, but they just wanted to change some things uh, that that they thought would be more uh, ma uh, mass appealing. You know, uh, but he didn't want to change anything. He wanted to make it the way he wanted it. So he you know produced and directed all this stuff. Or, well, or got, or he got some people to like produce this, and uh, he directed it himself and made it the way he wanted to make it. So that's admirable. 
uh, stick to your guns, do your own art, but he, he seemed like he sort of, I don't think he made a whole lot of money off this. It was like an indie project. Uh, it's a lesser known film of the 80s. It wasn't like a blockbuster or anything, but it looks like it could have been a blockbuster. Like it has that big budget feel to it, or, you know, for as far as 80s standards go. Uh, it feels like a bigger movie than it probably was. Uh, you have the interviews with the two main actor and actress. Uh, and, uh, yeah, they, it turns out they became a real-life couple after this film, uh, which is weird because she, she says she just had a child right before this movie was made. Uh, I'm not sure who the baby daddy was, but it wasn't this guy. And uh, I guess maybe... I don't, yeah, I don't know if the kid was like at a wedlock or, or yeah, it doesn't fucking matter really, but uh, yeah, they ended up getting married uh, on the set. She had a big crush on him and uh, I guess, you know, working that long close to each other, playing a couple, I guess, you know, shit just goes that way. But uh, I think they're still together. They're, they seemed like they were together in the interview. Uh, they didn't really get into all that, but uh, pretty pretty good interview there. Uh, you have a reunion that takes place in a, at the diner. Uh, all these like extra actors that weren't the couple show up. Uh, Denise Crosby, Brian Thompson. He's he, Brian Thompson played the hel helicopter pilot uh, in this. Uh, he's there. A few other people are there. Some some re very recognizable people. Some not so recognizable. But they all pile into this diner and they just have this big you know get together, mingle. And uh, then they do like some, like with the director, they do like some questions and answers type of thing. Uh, it's pretty interesting. It's, you know, everybody's really old now. It's kind of sad just seeing people that like I dread today. <laughs> it's just crazy what time does to you. <laughs> it's ruthless. Uh, yeah, but you have that. You have a interview with... Uh, Paul Haslinger from uh, Tangerine Dream, he kind of talks about, you know, composing, and uh, they actually used a sample from Risky Business, because they did the track on Risky Business, and they just used some of that and rearranged it a little bit and touched it up, and then they came up with a track for Miracle Mile. But they did a few other things, too. Uh, pretty good music as far as uh, the, the score goes, but the... I think they were playing, like, some... Uh, music of the era during the film and not, no it wasn't really into all that uh it's a very 80s movie it's you know it's 89 it's about to be 90 but it's still very 80s <laughs> uh the clothing the music all that it's it's, it's uh yeah it's, it stands out but it, you know it doesn't bother me I, I, some people just like uh can't overlook things like that they're just like oh these people are dressed stupid i hate this movie the movie is great like, if you just overlook, I, I mean, I, I personally like seeing, like, dated things like that, because it's like getting in a time machine and going somewhere else besides this shitty now, you know? <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's, the music, uh, aside from the Tangerine Dream stuff, is eh. But the Tangerine Dream tracks were pretty good, in my opinion. Uh, but he, yeah, he, could, he talks about being in the band and, you know, all that good stuff. Uh, there's a deleted scenes and outtakes reel. It's not a, you know, restored or anything. So you, you get to see the comparison to like how bad it looked compared to the now the the new arrow upgrade. Uh, looks pretty good now. The video quality is pretty good. Sounds good. Uh, but the outtakes, you know, they they were actually uh, more entertaining deleted scenes than you I'm used to seeing. Just and it just, I think it was more just the way they laid them out. It's like one continuous thing, and they kind of flow together, and uh, it's got a nice like vibe to it, I guess. But uh, you know, you can go without seeing it, but it wasn't bad. Uh, I didn't watch the Rebeo Rising short story. I didn't. I, I started it, but I was like, eh. it's just like a still image, and then he's like, the director's like talking, reading the story over. But uh, yeah. Pretty good movie. Definitely recommend it. That's it for the extras, uh, pretty much. But uh, I'll leave a link in the description where you can find this, Miracle Mile, uh, either from Kino Lorber, which which uh, I th 
I was mistaken about the Kino Lorber release. I think that actually came out a little earlier than than the Arrow one, maybe by a, a year or two, actually. Uh, I'm not sure why I got that so close together, but whatever. I'll leave a link in the description to uh, the Arrow version, which I'm reviewing now, and the, maybe the Kino version, too, if you just have Region A player, because it's definitely worth watching a movie, even if you can't get the UK release. Uh, but, of course, hit that like button. If you liked the video, hit subscribe. If you want to see more, I'll see you guys later.